So for a while, cultural heritage stakeholders have been involved in digital transformation through inventory or scientific image database, investigation or educational tools. The methods and tools combine archaeology, physics, chemistry, digital science and technologies. Those innovating methods can revolutionize and enhance the understanding, preservation, restoration, and transmission of cultural heritage and open up new perspectives. The newest progress in imagery enables, for instance, the creation of digital copy that can apply for research, management, and transfer of skills for cultural heritage. What issues surround today's practices? What are the materials, technologies, and innovative methods to improve the preservation of cultural heritage? What opportunities and challenges arise from the use of digital technologies and artificial intelligence? Finally, sustainable management of cultural heritage also implies securing the future of the data and archives produced in great numbers. How to preserve them in the long term? how to guarantee the sharing and interoperability of them with a European solution. In order to better apprehend these important issues, we have the huge honor to welcome our international panel of experts. Coming from Nicosia, Sorin Hermon is Associate Professor at the Cyprus Institute on 3D Scientific Visualization on Large-Scale Data Infrastructures in Archaeology and Cultural Heritage. Welcome. Coming from Germany, Dr. Martin Zabeski is Digital Strategy Officer at the Stylische Kunstsammlungen Dresden. <laughs> Sorry for my accent. <laughs> and will highlight digital issues in the museum field. Coming from Italy, Roberto Scopigno, as the director of the Institute of Information Science and Technologies at the National Research Council of Italy, will present new technological tools applied to heritage. And then, from Paris, <laughs> Livio De Luca, Research Director at the CNRS and the Director at the Models and Simulations for Architecture and Heritage Laboratory, MAP. You will speak about digital inputs in the restoration of Notre Dame de Paris. So please, Sarin Ehrman. <laughs> Hello, and I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, having this uh, event and having me here. It is a great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank Livio De Luca for uh, raising my attention to this uh, round, uh, to this uh, session as well. Um, the work that I will present here is the result of uh, many years of collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Franco Nicolucci from the University of Florence many dialogues with uh, Michel Menon, former director at uh, CTRMF, and many, many other uh, colleagues. Uh, can I see the presentation? It's not mine. It's not mine. I can try to talk. But <laughs> so. So, à la régie, il faudrait passer pour mettre sur les. We would like to ask uh, the technical staff to please post um, Mr. Sorin Hermann's slide. I sent it. Uh, normalement, on en a une. We should have received Mr. Hermann's presentation. Could you please display it? Non, mais il n'a pas la présentation. Ouais, tout à fait. 
<laughs> Martin Zawiski, you can. Technology is fine if it works. <laughs> Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Dieck. Greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And this important conference in this uncertain times. Today, I'm going to give a short insight into the ongoing digital transformation process within museums, especially the Saxon State Art Collections. First, I have to say digitization in museums is challenging because of various reasons. On the one hand, the nature of digitization itself has to be regarded as institutions built on long time preservation and sustainability. Museums are confronted with fast and dynamic technology changes and fundamental turns in work processes. All areas of museum activities are affected by this. In my, in my opinion, the main challenges for the museums are to build up competences in planning, implementing, and operating digital systems, as well as implementing digital methods into their working life. In addition, establishing and operating digital systems require extra funding and extra staff. This funding often has to be, has to be raised additionally to things museums usually do. Another aspect is that cultural heritage institutions in general, and especially museums, have particular requirements on digital systems because they work in various areas and with very different data types. Possible fields of data processing in museums are, for example, data of objects, artworks, history, exhibition making, research data, provenience of artworks, restoration processes, because you have to do a lot, uh, much documentation if you are restoring an artwork. You have education programs, you have event management, and even art creation is a topic you have to cope with. Existing platforms are usually designed to care only for a few aspects of the complex data processed by the museums as a whole. However, advantages of using digital systems are obvious. Certain obstacles prevent museums and other cultural heritage institutions to use those, especially for communication and collaboration with others. Concerns are, for example, that the protection of intellectual property, privacy, and cultural heritage data may be problematic because commercial systems are often bound due to United States jurisdiction and have very specific agreements in data protection and data usage. This indirect and sometimes even justified fear of giving away control rights and the data itself repeals cultural stakeholders from using such services, even if it were possible. Due to the privacy issue, governmental or administrational restrictions do not allow a usage. On a very practical level, giving external users access to own systems often is not possible or needs high efforts. Small and mid-sized institutions are not capable to use commercial systems at all, or they may have the capacities to run open source solutions on their own. Large institutions in opposition often have their own solutions, but those individual systems do not fit together with other ones. Consequently, a key issue is to promote digital collaboration between museums. I want to underline this with a small example. In 2015, the porcelain collection in Dresden started a project to catalog over 8,000 East Asian porcelain objects. Over 30 experts from all over Europe and abroad worked on identifying and cataloging the objects. 
We wanted to use digital system, but we had pro practical problems. Direct exchange of large data amounts, we had multiple high resolution images of the objects, was not possible due to limited server resources. External scientists had only limited access on our database system and no access on our asset management systems. External experts had to be integrated into our digital project workflows while not being member of our own staff. We had to reintegrate the created knowledge into our own systems very costly. And only monolingual interfaces have been in operation when we started the project. At least we developed a specific digital solution for this project, but with high efforts using workarounds or semi-automatic procedures. Looking at our digital activities, we came to the opinion that there is a need for effective collaboration tools that regard the special requirements of museums. We think that would increase the usage of digital technologies there. Therefore, we support the idea of a European museum collaboration space as a centralized platform to offer those tools to related stakeholders. We suggest the following key features. An easy access for all stakeholders and easy ways to collaborate. European jurisdiction, privacy standards and data protection is the most important point. Multiple tools for collaboration, a shared data space for mutual research, mutual document edition and mutual exhibition planning, uh, calendar sharing, and so on. An independent European institution that ensures safe, secure, and trustworthy communication and collaboration should operate it. A permanent infrastructure based on open access technology that allows long-time usage is mandatory for us. Very important is that the development of such a European museum collaboration space has to be accompanied by infrastructural actions to ensure broadband access, even for institutions and in rural areas. To realize our idea, we were participated in initiating a new initiative on that. Luckily, as Mr. Ehler told, the EU Parliament granted funding for cultural heritage cloud within the Horizon Europe program. And currently, EU working groups work on defining the features and the main concepts for that. Some projects started, and first tenders on this topic has been, have been published. We think that is a great opportunity to integrate the aspects of museums' digital needs into the context of the planned cultural heritage cloud. Let me conclude. Digital transformation challenges museums in a special way. Often digital solutions for collaboration are not used due to various reasons and concerns. A key issue is to emerge digital collaboration between museums. We think our idea of a European museum collaboration space could support the usage of digital technologies within museums and their collaboration. First steps have already been made. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, to go on on that space and collaboration for museum, please, Roberto. Good morning to everyone. I would like also to thank the organizers for having invited me to present some ideas and activities of my uh, research group. My name is Roberto Scobigno. I came from the Italian National Research Council. I will try to show you some experiences as uh, some uh, um, condition for an improved use of digital media in CH professional activities. 
So we have already seen from the um, talk of the, of the colleagues who just uh, spoke before me that uh, CH data is extremely rich because we have a huge cardinality of artworks, billions of artworks throughout Europe. We have a very uh, high uh, differentiated complexity in shape in sides, in materials used, in reflection characteristics, which makes uh, uh, an urgent need the one of using many different data types to represent these uh, artworks. So the constructing a, a representation, a digital representation, cannot be done by choosing a single type of data type, for example, a three-dimensional representation, because we need many different ways of representing different aspects. So in, in C, which we use obviously images and not just uh, only photographic images but many other types of specific uh, images formats like panoramic images, RTI images and so on. We use 3D models at level of a single artworks up to the level on an entire historical city. Uh, we use tomographic machines based on X-ray in order to understand what is inside an object with, without having to dismantle it and to destroy it. And uh, um, and we also have a large number of different uh, uh, scientific investigation technologies which also produce data in terms of graph or, or images or uh, whatever else. So we have many data types. We do not have a winning data uh, type. Uh, we have to manage all this information all together and we have to integrate with uh, information first with uh, all the uh, semantic information. So encoding, linking, interconnecting, knowledge using the FAIR uh, principle. And then also by simply focusing on, on the visual part, by integrating different types of data, because in many cases, in order to solve the research questions, we cannot limit to the analysis, to the inspection of the single data type, but in many cases we need uh, the, the help of multiple of them in order to get inside and to discover uh, something. In order to this, uh, our professional community, museums, uh, curators, uh, restorers, and so on, uh, it's uh, a very complex domain composed by many different type of experiences and background. And we should be able to, to link all these uh, experiences, all these knowledge uh, with uh, cooperative approaches, which will allow uh, possibly remote uh, working group to work together on a single uh, artwork uh, by means, for example, of a digital twin or a digital clones and to allow them to discover things and to uh, also encode the discovery process which brought to new uh, insight. This uh, cooperation uh, has been attempted so far in several places, but most of the experiences has been disconnected and partial. We lack coordination, we lack a, a common basis uh, enabling cooperation, as has been uh, underlined by the previous speaker. And we also lack uh, some training because uh, this new technology needs an effort on training in order to be mastered by everyone, also in small museums or small communities. So the need of a common platform, data model, repository, and so on, and also the related tools is really felt by the community. In my opinion, this, uh, the design of this common platform should be a, an evolutionary design. Should we, we should not design from the scratch the final system. The final system will be the results, should be the results of several projects, several activities that will add content, add uh, maybe new data types, we'll add new tools, and the, just the, the, the composition of, of all these efforts in time will create the common platform that was evoked uh, a few minutes ago. In, in this vision, Obviously, we will, we will not have a single consortia, but we will have multiple consortia. We should uh, cooperate and build together the, the, the final cloud. A very important point is the availability of assessment instruments. If we have a, the idea, the vision of something evolving in time, we should from the very beginning provide the instruments, implement the instruments to assess the quality of the work that has been done. For example, to understand 
out of many tools, which are the ones which are more used by the community, strongly accepted by the communities and should be preserved in the future and possibly should be extended, and which are maybe the ones which are not so much successful and could be closed or abandoned in some way. So evolution means that someone will survive and someone, unfortunately, will die. Uh, just to show you a couple of examples to, to go to the practical side, a couple of examples in which uh, the, the use of many media is needed, I will present you first uh, the results of, uh, of uh, conservation studies focusing on the Ecce Homo uh, by Antonello da Messina. Uh, here, the, the painting, it's a painting on wood, uh, which had some small detachments of, uh, of the painted surface. And the wood underneath the paintings is completely uh, full of uh, historical woodwork galleries. So the conservation query was, where are the worm galleries? Are they in, uh, in the vicinity of, uh, of the detachment of the uh, of, uh, uh, painted surface? Uh, in order to, do, uh, to, to reply to this question, we planned a CT scan, which uh, X-ray CT scan, to understand the, the pattern of, uh, of worm galleries. Uh, standard uh, um, 3D scanning, um, active 3D scanning, in order to get an high resolution uh, model of a painted surface. And then we developed an interactive inspection tool working on the web, which allowed to the, um, to the curator to analyze uh, on the web uh, the status of the painting. As you see, you have in front the results of the 3D scanning, on the back all the worm galleries. The interface is very simple, has just a few functionalities, the one which are needed for this task, and uh, it gives the possibility of selecting a worm gallery, selecting the corresponding area on top of the painting, and make a, a measure uh, of, uh, of the distance between the painting and the worm gallery, but in this case it's 4.5 millimeters, so it's a safe uh, uh, location in some sense. The second example that I have, the second tool, has been designed in order to provide a, a system to document uh, the result of all the study performing due a complex restoration project focusing on the Neptune monument in Bologna. In this case, we had a huge number of different materials from text, uh, historical reports, um, uh, and modern reports, images, historical images, and new images, three-dimensional models, and so on, diagnostic analysis, a lot of documents, and we built a, a three-dimensional system based on the digital twin of, uh, of the artwork in which all the data have been referred uh, geospatially to the, uh, um, uh, to the location of space in which they had uh, a meaning, a link. Uh, and this allows to enable automatic spatial indexing of data simply navigating the, 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 the model. By navigating the model, I can access the uh, um, single items of information that I am, might be interested in, uh, in, in working on or to study. Uh, the system supports annotation, which are an important part, and supports the drafting of graphic drawings directly on top of the digital surface of the station. Everything works uh, on the web and has been used by a group uh, of around 20 uh, curators and restorers, uh, both on, on site, directly in front of the statue, in the hotel, in the night, or in their office during uh, other period of time. Uh, you see that everything is interactive. On the right most part of the image, you have the list of documents which are related to this specific portion of the, of the monument. And you may switch, switch on or switch off or open any one of these uh, items. Uh, for example, in these moments, all the drawings uh, which are associated to uh, maps uh, uh, characterizing the conservation status are open. You may either open all of them or just switch, uh, in, uh, switch on and off a single uh, of these drawings. So let me conclude. 
digital media tools are an, uh, an important element to enhance uh, the capability of our professionals in CH for understanding, documenting, and communicating to the public the, uh, uh, the, the, the value of our heritage. I just presented two, exa two exa examples, but you may imagine that much, much more could be devised uh, and implemented. And uh, I would underline following user needs because this is really important. One of the problems that we experimented several times in this domain is the use of general purpose application may be very complex, may be full of functionalities, very hard to be learned, while our user needs just a few functionalities. And so the development of specific tools opens the possibility of designing something which is working fine, but it's also very useful, very easy to use and effective. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much, Roberto. Well, now we'll go on with Livio, who will e explain to us how that cloud could be very useful in the case of Notre Dame de Paris restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. But j'ai la responsabilité. It is my honor to uh, be able to speak in the language of Moliere as I do my presentation today. Thank you. So as we observed uh, in the two previous uh, presentations and also in uh, some other ways, digital uh, imaging has a very important impact on uh, heritage sciences. So there are two tra trajectories, in fact, uh, that we can retrace that come from about 30 evolutions. So we've gone from uh, digital uh, libraries to having uh, to be able to have multi-dimensional uh, data. So we have uh, multi-temporal, multi-modal, uh, multi-spectral. So there's also different behaviors of materials. And then there are also uh, access modalities. So we've gone from individual uh, production to uh, building platforms, digital platforms, and this brings about collaborative approaches as well as participatory approaches. Now, how should we understand uh, the vision that underlines the design of a collaborative uh, European cloud for uh, cultural heritage? In order to uh, understand this vision, we need to bring, to bring together three main trends whereby we can anticipate in which situations we will find ourselves in the next 10 years. So just to simplify things, we could say that heritage is an area in which there are various stakeholders that conduct different activities on heritage objects that then generate data. So what's happening now? We're going from a fragmented and isolated digitization to a, a digital tool. And this, we can see new acquisitions and new anal analyses. And Soren will, of course, refer to this in his presentation. We're also going from managing a very large scope of activities uh, conducted by uh, numerous stakeholders. And these uh, activities have not been usually um, kept and preserved. But now we're moving towards a digital uh, continuum. So this is a process whereby we'll have traceability of these activities, but we'll also be able to uh, memorialize them. Last but not least, we're also going from the production of uh, individual production of data towards uh, building uh, social uh, technical systems that are built uh, as uh, adaptable and open platforms. That is to say, we're moving towards digital ecosystems. And I'll give you an example of this uh, soon. So how can such a vision be implemented? And this could bring about a new uh, generation of data, data that's multidimensional, interconnected, and collectively enriched. And this goes back to what my colleagues said prior to my presentation. 
So this will be enriched by the various visions that focus on these heritage objects. And this means we can create uh, common uh, digital assets, and this could form tomorrow's cultural heritage, perhaps. While on one hand, we can understand what could be the benefits of this in terms of management and access, in terms of sharing, in terms of dissemination of such data, we also need to ask ourselves, what are the potential impacts of such a transformation in terms of how we produce knowledge, and that is to say, on heritage science. Indeed, heritage science um, is made up of uh, the comparison or the confrontation, rather, between uh, tangible, tangible objects, uh, the perceptions of viewers, as well as other matters. So one of the key challenges today is to connect uh, the material dimension of objects with uh, the mechanisms through which collective knowledge is produced. So this means we need to slowly move uh, this digital cursor from the physical dimension of objects in order to move towards the knowledge that is mobilized, mobilized in order to understand such objects. And this is central to uh, the work of um, of the groups that are brought together to uh, work on Notre Dame. Uh, so the uh, CNS teams, uh, the, and these are 175 uh, scholars and nine working groups. Uh, so the goal here is to build a body of knowledge of, on Notre Dame Cathedral, but the goal is also to build a portrait of uh, the thematic extension of cultural heritage in the digital era. This means that um, it will thus become an object of research because the digital ecosystem that we are currently developing aims to gather data that has been collected and produced uh, through various projects, but it also wants, seeks to merge the um, representation that is uh, constantly changing of the cathedral and also to use the data that has been mobilized through uh, the study of the cathedral. So we're using two essential tools in order to do this in order to build a collective knowledge system. First of all, the, the, the memorizing uh, the trajectories used by scientists in order to develop knowledge. So from the initial point up to the moment in which they've uh, conducted uh, an in-depth analysis of the data by trying to memorize the spatial location as well the type of activities, technical and uh, intellectual activities that have been conducted on site. So on the slide, for example, you see the chain of activities that have been conducted by all the experts in order to rebuild the original uh, shape of this arc. And by describing all of the different uh, steps, uh, what they've done, how they've m done digital m uh, modeling, and how they've created um, other steps. And step by step, we can build the characteristics of human knowledge that has been uh, mobilized. And then we bring that to a digital chain that will remember uh, the collective study. The next link is analysis. The analysis is the link created by the searchers between the material objects, the physical objects, and the characteristics of these objects, and their own uh, objects of knowledge. Just imagine a thread that um, has that is a, that brings together the three D three D model of a generator, an engineer, and then it goes up. Uh, uh, to the roof of the cathedral after the um, fire and imagine that you have a fragment of the wood uh, framing of the wood in order to or determine where the material comes from and so from this beam you might also have a nail and that nail will also be um, analyzed so the approach that we're trying to develop seeks to uh, highlight this type of uh, shared and overlapping uh, area of interest. So it's uh, spatial, it's temporal, it regards uh, shapes, but also it entails multidisciplinary knowledge. And so here we're trying to create a connection between all the different areas of the cathedral, but we're also trying to examine a plurality of outlooks. How do various researchers envision this reality? 
So what we're trying to build next to the physical cathedral, we're trying to build a cathedral of data, of knowledge, that has been produced by uh, shared knowledge. And so this would certainly be achieved by creating a collaborative European uh, cloud of knowledge. Because um, this will produce a digital memory of a collective endeavor, an emblematic uh, corpus of scientific data, and also an ecosystem that will enable us to build uh, other cathedrals of data and knowledge. And this means that, thanks to this, we can experiment with larger scale collaborations. For example, by bringing together uh, collections of objects that are far geographically, but that share certain typologically, typological uh, characteristics, or that are also uh, very similar in terms of conservation challenges. We might even, by building, rather by building uh, these joint spaces, we could also examine much more complex relationships that uh, tie the researchers to the objects that they're studying. And so there, we need to uh, bring together the objects that we're studying, as well the scientific questions that we're ra raising, the study protocols that we are mobilizing, that is to say, what instruments are we using, and what type of vocabulary are we using. So we can bring all of that together, and this process might be envisioned as uh, overcoming borders. As we know, Europe has been a land of boundaries and borders that have been crossed by the European people. But today, we are overcoming those boundaries. Thank you for your attention, and the interpreter apologizes, but the sound was very hard to hear. Thank you. I would like just to ask before. Just wait a minute, please. Um, uh, I would like just to be f to to ask you uh, about that cloud, that space for museum. What is its calendar? Is it still functioning? Not not yet. You have the microphones. Me. So, uh, as you uh, already seen by the presentation of uh, Roberto, but also by the presentation uh, of Martin, today we have a clear idea of the needs on one side, a clear idea of the state of the art of technologies. And what is really interesting, um, also coming from the Roberto's presentation, is that the main technologies already exist have just to be integrated today. And we are the owner of these technologies because the scientific community have produced since several years uh, many scientific projects by introducing innovative tools. But we are not able today to exploit them just because we need a common environment for it. So this is to me the first point for uh, illustrating the, the potential of the deployment and concerning the calendar. I think it depends on the next actions from the European Commission, but uh, by, by following the words of this morning, uh, it seems that it will be uh, very, very soon. So I, I imagine in some f first calls for implementing uh, starting uh, in 2023, I hope. Well, thank you for the details. Please, Sorin, you can go on. And we apologize again for the inconvenience. Take two is always better, no? So, um, digital technologies have been introduced to the world of uh, social sciences and humanities, and in particular, uh, archaeology, more than 25 years ago. Perhaps by the nature of archaeology being a multidisciplinary um, domain of research, they were uh, adopted quite fast, and we see today a very ambitious project, uh, Ariadne Plus, that gathers uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, archaeological uh, data. 
Um, throughout these years, I have seen a growth of interest by uh, humanities researchers into digital technologies, culminating with a very ambitious uh, Congress held in France in Marseille in 2013, which for me was a, a highlight uh, event from where we should have uh, learned quite a lot and move uh, forward. Unfortunately, we had some events in the last uh, in the last years. Nevertheless, I'm very optimistic also because I heard uh, discussions uh, in the first session about uh, planning how to move forward, uh, in particular the involvement of citizens, the involvement of creative industries, which really broadens and opens up uh, this domain a lot. So what I would like to focus my uh, talk here now is uh, really to make a step back perhaps from what uh, Livio presented and talk about uh, data. Because at the end, at the backbone of anything, we, we, this, are, this is the material that we are working on. So um, a few years ago, quite a few now, uh, there was a very interesting uh, analysis done at uh, European level, looking at various disciplines and how much they focus on data, how much they, their research relies on uh, collaborative environments, on collaborative data, sharing data, and so forth. So as you see here, um, and probably as expected, uh, physics, uh, health, uh, uh, these kind of sciences are uh, the avant-garde of uh, sharing data. They understood immediately uh, what are the benefits from sharing data. Um, earth sciences are coming strong. And um, in our domain, and we see here, I put uh, Iris and Daria, we are still at uh, the beginning of this uh, process of building up uh, an environment for sharing data. I would like to mention here uh, a very ambitious uh, nationally funded project, Espadon, which actually builds on this uh, challenge, and I'm sure they will have great results uh, uh, later on. So why data is important? We all know the fair principles of finding data, accessing this data, making it interoperable, meaning that if we have different sources of data, they can talk to each other and have better results. And these are the reusability, and I think here the CCIs that were mentioned are particularly relevant to the R in the fair principles. Moreover, we have another process that started a few years ago, and this is the digital uh, transformation, and we still want to understand what does it mean and how to apply it. And in this sense, I think it's uh, important to highlight what is cultural heritage, what we are talking about. We have seen previously, uh, we presented it very clearly, how we have a monument, we have a shape, it has materials, but it has also the immaterial aspect, the intangible aspect that has to be documented as well, as well uh, in the, in the in introductory session. We have heard about uh, crafts, artisans. So uh, the intangible aspect is directly related and uh, embedded into our uh, cultural heritage. Then we have to think that this uh, heritage is within a certain natural environment, and this is where we have to protect that, but also in an anthropic environment. So, um, in order to have um, a shared space where we can rely on the data that we are using, one of the first thing is to understand how can we document the provenance of data. How can we assess the quality of this data? So in order to do so, we need to come up with common understanding on the processes on how data is created. For example, to have shared uh, experimental methods, to have uh, shared um, documentation systems, and so forth. Not to talk about uh, very technical aspects, for example, as uh, data standards. And then we have to think carefully on the intellectual property rights of this data. 
So what uh, we suggest in our group, but it's of course it's not uh, our idea only, is uh, Livio mentioned uh, as well the concept of uh, digital twin. So uh, I put down here some principles, some guiding principles on what exactly or how this digital twin could be envisioned. And this digital twin is actually the foundation, in my opinion, but not mine, only, and our opinion is really the, at, at the bottom of anything that we want to build up related to uh, sharing and uh, collaboration. So the digital twin has to represent one heritage asset. It has to contain data enough that it can simulate uh, the physical uh, behavior and the physical characteristics and the behavior of such uh, asset. Um, we have to come up uh, with the necessary tools to visualize, model, uh, assess uh, what happens to this, uh, uh, this asset in time. And Roberto presented some very uh, nice uh, tools uh, regarding this visualization. And ideally would be, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm recalling now the previous uh, talks about uh, climate change, on how to set up system that would allow to uh, adjust and update continuously the digital twin regarding the uh, situation of the physical uh, object uh, uh, outside there. So as an example, I bring here a work that we have done a few years ago, but we're still continuing to work on it. And I brought this as uh, an example of how important it is to have a clear collaboration between social scientists, art historians, conservators, chemi chemists, physicists, computer graphics people, everybody that uh, has to do with the heritage. So this is an icon attributed to Giovanni Baronzio. So how this attribute uh, happened, it's very important to, to document as well. Um, it was commissioned by uh, Francis Kanz many years ago. Uh, in the archives, we have found several versions of, uh, of this painting throughout the years, which um, several uh, conservations and restorations happened. And again, this is uh, very important to document uh, that as well. We have performed a series of uh, analyses, and you have seen here uh, some of them. Again, one of the first thing is to say, OK, we have these nice graphs. Well, not so nice, actually. Uh, we have these uh, results, but how can one be sure that these results are correct. Okay, they may say, okay, they know our lab, we are reliable, fine. But what happens if they don't know us or we are long gone, but the digital data is there? So this is clearly why it's very important to document um, in a coherent way the provenance of such uh, data. Then we have uh, restorations uh, analysis that uh, were performed, and you see here one example of uh, um, restoration that is called in painting. We have another type of restoration, which is a uh, trategio. And also we have found some very interesting, uh, <laughs> somebody draw actually uh, cracks in order to faint its, uh, um, to cover, let's say, the, the heavy restorations that happened in this part of the painting. We have used a lot of uh, different techniques here. In this case, it's uh, reflectance transformation imaging. Uh, we have used also 3D uh, in order to understand not only the materiality, but also uh, the techniques of paintings and uh, the whole, actually the whole history, the whole lifetime of this uh, painting. So um, I will be fast because I see I'm, my time will run out. How do we organize all this knowledge? We suggest to come up with a semantic uh, structure, which relies on an international standard called the CIDOC CRM, and I'm sure many of you know about it. Based on that, we suggest to come up with a structure for uh, an ontological structure for the digital twin. In this way, we have an international language that, that goes beyond the words because we are talking about concepts. And, um, and, and uh, 
uh, we are coming back now to the concept of digital twin with each uh, steps where we have a first step of conceptualization and instantiation. So we locate the heritage uh, asset in time and space. We describe its uh, property, and then we create uh, the virtual uh, environment re uh, related to that, and possibly the cloud that was mentioned is the ideal space for, for such a virtual research environment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas Soren. Thank you, and thank you for your adaptability, uh, again from Martin. Well, thank you for your very stimulating perspectives you, you open up. Uh, I would like to ask you, because the, the key aspect of those projects is dealing with uh, data accessibility and data sharing. And the concept of open science is commonly shared in the art of science. But is the cultural sector mainly characterized by its competition, man site of economic, diplomatic, or reputational reasons, ready to share its data? <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> By sure, this is a very tough question and difficult question. Um, for my personal experience of technologist, not uh, expert on art, I have seen uh, many times people who consider the specific artworks like some that they have to protect, they want to study in isolation, they don't want to share, they want just to uh, go to a book which will uh, formalize the, 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 the results of the research. And after the production of the book, maybe they start disseminating. This was the old way. I think that the younger generation are much, much, much more open to collaboration. Everybody understands uh, that uh, a single person is not able to master all the knowledge that is needed nowadays, where we need a mixture of, uh, of knowledges from the technical from to the artistic side. So I think that the, the, the model of a person working in isolation and covering the data, hiding the data, is something that is uh, going to, to, to end. So I'm quite optimistic towards the future, especially if we as technologists are able to give to this person the right tools for cooperating, because uh, a reason for the lack of cooperation has been also the, the lack of tools supporting cooperation. Yeah. Martin, perhaps you have something to add? Yeah. yeah. Um, the question is very difficult <laughs> because uh, technical theme sharing is easy, I think. But um, for the museums, for example, there are difficult objects. Uh, we have intellectual property issues and confidential data as well, if you think about security things, and you can share this at all. Uh, but if you want to spread culture, I think uh, exchange and collaboration is necessary. And so we have to find ways to, um, yes, do away in the middle between the special needs and uh, issues we have to think about and uh, the approach to share data and to share the knowledge as a kind of, um, yes, cultural interaction, as a kind of common basis uh, for uh, the culture. And um, in general, it depends on the main strategy and open-mindedness open -mindedness, uh, if you want to share your data and have the benefits from it or not to share it and stay on your own. And so technically, the most, in most cases, it's no problem. It's a, um, it's a thing of the general approach. And so if this... Um, approach is to be open-minded, to collaborate, to share, then the technical systems already, I think. So um, in the one of the first slides, what I, I have shown examples of communities that understood and realized the importance of data sharing. Mm -hmm. Medicine does it regularly. I think uh, the biggest challenge that we have is to make people understand that sharing is much better and it's beneficial for everybody. Um, one of the direct results of this kind of uh, sharing data is that when you sit around the table, well, also here, we have experts from very different uh, domains. Once we talk and one we share and one we, once we explain our data, new ideas come. 
So it's only, in my opinion, it's only a matter of demonstrating the benefits. So what are the concrete adds-on that come from sharing data? The other aspect is, uh, well, it's not really psychological, but almost, how to make people talk to each other. In the past, uh, the, there was not really dialogue. The idea was, I'm an art historian, I'm a curator, I'm an archaeologist, I'm giving a sample or an object to somebody, please analyze it, send me back the results. So there was not really dialogue. I think what changed and is continuously changing is the idea of the dialogue. And this is where I think we have to put uh, a lot of uh, emphasis. Yeah. yeah, I can understand that sharing is That's, better. Uh, yeah. One more comment. I think we are not evangelists of open data policy at all. I mean, sharing may have many different meanings. In my opinion, sharing is opening your data to someone else. And this someone else can be the group, the small group of people with whom you are working in a given instant of time, maybe a slightly larger group because you are willing to extend the access to some other experts. And maybe your community of, uh, of, uh, of uh, art historians or curators, or maybe the large public. The focus is not to uh, create a digital clone and immediately open to everybody. The, the idea is to have a system which allows to take your decision on who has, uh, who has to enter in the data in each instant of time, according to the status of your activity. I think it's really important to, to give to the, uh, to the user this possibility. Yes, I, I completely agree with the, this last sentence from uh, Roberto, because we have to consider collaboration at different scales. We, we, we need to provide technologies for fostering uh, also the social networking uh, around uh, the use and the reuse of data. And finally, uh, by looking at the next generation, I would reuse the, the word from Mr. Elner this morning. We, we need less dystopia and more utopia about data sharing in cultural heritage. And what are the limits of open science? Uh, we have seen major public actors sharing their data, and the data has been used by private actors, commercial actors. I think about, for example, in France, uh, the National Institute of Geography, IGN, with the, the maps, and how we can create an open cultural space that includes economic values and that kind of problematics. <laughs> These are only, only very, very difficult questions. Uh, um, I, in my presentation, I mentioned the, the notion of digital commons. And if we uh, see at this notion, uh, together with the digital twin notion, we can easily understand that there is a permanent link we can establish between uh, uh, our cultural heritage, the existing, the, the real cultural heritage, and the data and knowledge that we can produce. So we can maintain, still maintain this link, uh, which guarantees probably uh, the economic sustainability on one side, and the, the ownership of the data we produce within a public vision. But of course, we need to improve and to imagine scenarios uh, with several partners, also by using and reusing within the digital um, and the creative industries um, um, framework this data. Uh, but to my opinion, uh, by using uh, a few of uh, economic intelligence, Especially concerning the use and the um, uh, the use and the development of our 
technological frameworks in order to maintain this link and in order to um, control and to trace the evolution of the use and the reuse of this data. And this is an, an essential issue um, to be explored within the IPR, the intellectual property rights issues around data uh, that are discussed today in several uh, members, um, state members of uh, Europe. And I think that the initiative of uh, um, a cloud, a collaborative cloud in Europe could foster this perspective. Yes, sir. So uh, for me, the keyword that I would use is uh, value. Mm -hmm. What is the value of the data that I'm putting out and for who? is this value. So I think uh, for me, the challenge, the, one of the main challenges is to have data represented or described in such, such a way that many others will understand the value of that for them. So when I'm creating a 3D model, I'm, I say, okay, it's the best 3D model. It's the most accurate one. I'm putting out there so whoever wants to use it, they can use it. That's a very wrong attitude because people in the game industry need something specific. People in uh, climate that monitor uh, climate uh, effects and impacts on a building, they need something else. So if we don't have a rich description of this data and we, don't, we are not able to customize in a way the data for their use or understand the, the value that they have from this data, we are missing it. But I think we are on the right track and what we need to do is to understand how to capture and describe formally these uh, potential values for the various uh, stakeholders. Again, the, the case of the value associated to a, art, to a digital artwork, it's another matter where we need an infrastructure, we need the people experts on, uh, on law, on uh, economic assets, uh, which uh, have an experience. Uh, I think we should not consider the Louvre in, in which we are. I think to a small museum. Is a, a, a small museums in Italy, in France, in UK, in Netherlands able to sell? In my, in my experience, in my experience, they are not able to sell. Even a large museum like uh, Galerie dell'Accademia, where the Digital Michelangelo project took place at the beginning 20 years ago, it was the first digital 3D model of a David Michelangelo. It had some value. I was involved in several discussions with companies. At the end, we have not sell to anyone because the uh, Galleria dell'Accademia did not have the, the staff able to do this type of job and the Ministry of uh, uh, Culture in Italy neither. So the situation right now is, as, as far as I know, is that the amount of income coming in our museums from the cell of, uh, of uh, digital artworks, uh, digital copies of artwork, it's really negligible because we do not have the right uh, people uh, which are able to do the business. And here is another uh, sector in which we need some European effort because a, a single infrastructure could work for everyone and the revenues can be redirected to all the small museums which provide it. And I think there is some space. Think, for example, to uh, all the industries of books for, for, for students art books, uh, history books, uh, these produce images everywhere and, uh, and we can try to, to use. Multimedia market is another one, uh, computer games is another one. So there are, there is potential, but we need people able to run uh, this job. And actually we do not have. Yeah, um, an interesting question, of course. Um, it depends if you think of cultural heritage as a kind of infrastructure the society is based on. And if you think about this concept, it should matter if uh, you use this data for private use or for uh, a commercial use at all, because sometimes it's very hard to decide whether it's private or commercial use or public use. For example, in Germany, we have a system of uh, public financed um, television and private financed television, and even the public financed television is a kind of competition to the uh, uh, private financed, and so there are commercial 
in the sense of law. And so we couldn't give it to them if we say only our data is for uh, for private use or for, for non-commercial use. And so that could be easier to, if you think that's an, an infrastructure you think of. But on the other hand, um, even if you think on the artist and creative uh, people, they have to live from their art and their creative acti activities. And so we have to uh, think about them as well. And so we have to ensure that they get a fair share. Right. Um, here as museums work with their data and their creativity. And so maybe collecting societies could be a solution where there is a fair, where is a fair use of the data and the uh, artists and creative people get their share of it. And um, otherwise, with the new technologies as blockchain or NFTs, we have uh, technical solutions that could ensure the originality, that there is um, the origin and the uh, exclusiveness of the objects. But uh, if I talk about NFTs, we have to talk about environmental issues because it's very, very uh, carbon consuming, consuming to do this. But even there, there are solutions to have both sides. And yes, you have to decide whether to do this or this direction or make a mix of this. Well, thank you, Martin, and thank you to, to all of you. I would then uh, that uh, a European solution can guarantee some uh, a non-state solution and a non-commercial solution. So we have to go on on that way. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> So now you can break for lunch. Those of you who have signed up can go to the coquette space for lunch. Now, please don't forget as you're going out to hand back your translation headsets of, and that way you can get your uh, ID card back. That can be handy. So uh, we'll get these. This will be um, broadcast this afternoon. Remember, check the programs, look at the activities where you've signed up. There are three different locations, all about five minutes away, uh, walking time. So think, uh, remember, you need to be on time. As you've seen, there's a lot of information, but the flip side of that coin is we're short on time. So about 10, 15 minutes ahead of time would be good so that you can handle all of the uh, uh, technical issues, getting the right number of headsets and all that. So have a great afternoon. And personally, I will see you again for the plenary sessions tomorrow morning at the, National, the French National Library. <laughs>